Our guest today, Dr. Tracy Weiland, is a global speaker and media contributor on the impact of technology on work, careers, and women's leadership. I'm Grace Trafton of The Better Part. Please stay tuned and hear what she has to say about women and leadership. Welcome to The Better Part, a program that encompasses a diverse spectrum of topics important to our community, which we hope will both inform and entertain you. We invite you to sit back and enjoy the program. Dr. Tracy Weiland has authored 11 books, including one titled, Women Lead. Her latest book, Employed for Life, 21st Century Career Trends, was released in 2014. We're fortunate to have her as a returning guest on KMVT 15. Welcome again, Tracy. Thank you, Grace. Thanks so much for having me. So good to see you here again. And first of all, I want to ask you, what inspired you to write this book, Women Lead? Well, you know, Grace, let's go back to 2012, right? And I heard a statistic that really um, was very compelling, that a woman started a business somewhere in the world every 60 seconds. And it made me think, huh, something's changing with women. So I looked up other statistics and trends around that time. It happened to be the Summer Olympics. There were more women from America participating in the Olympics than men. There, we had the highest number of women in Congress, the highest number of women in the military. We have women exceeding in education and pursuing more advanced degrees than men. So clearly, something was different, and I wanted to take a look at it with leadership. And what were some of your major findings uh, regarding leadership? So, you know, this was a very interesting study. There were two studies, a survey, which is a quantitative study, and interviews with over 200 women leaders, a qualitative study. And what we found when we surveyed men and women as leaders, very interesting results. We looked at leadership characteristics and attributes, very commonly used in surveys today. Women rated or scored women highest on all 10 characteristics and attributes of modern day leadership. Is that right? Very interesting. Yes. And here's the kicker. Men did not score men highest Is on right? all 10 leadership characteristics and attributes. That's really surprising. That's right. So I said, maybe we should look at the men a little more. Is it all men or is it certain men? And that's when we had our second interesting finding. Men varied by generation. Hmm. So boomer men saw a lot of differences. Boomer men today are 53 and up. Mm -hmm. But Generation X and Y men, which is basically age 53 and younger, were pretty much gender agnostic, hmm. which gives you a lot of insights to potentially what's happening in the workforce today. And did you find other gender or generational differences? Absolutely. So, of course, as I started to dig into the generation differences, here's what we found. Young women, which is our Generation Y millennials, mm -hmm. age 33 and under, are much more confident than women who are boomers, women who are Generation X, and also Generation Y millennial men. So our younger generation of women are very confident. Boomer men were more confident than boomer women, right? Mm -hmm. So the population of 53 and up. So we did see differences between the generations and genders. And I think these are profound to think about the workforce today because you do have three generations in the workforce and right. actually we're moving into four. Right, right. And do you think that women have to lead like men in order to achieve success? Well, absolutely not. From our findings, right, what we found is that women are really positioned to be modern day leaders. And mm -hmm. we're seeing that as trends, right, Mary Barra. GM, Ursula Brown, Xerox, Meg Whitman, 
Sheryl Sandberg. So mm -hmm. we see that women have moved into leadership positions. Mm -hmm. We also see that the younger generation, regardless of gender, is pretty much agnostic and very supportive of women in leadership. So you're not gonna find the same kind of lens from previous eras. So I think that's, I say, yes, of course women are positioned to be leaders. So according to your study, what were some of the key leadership attributes? So, so that's very interesting. So what we found across the board with both genders is that communication skills was the number one ranked. Mm. And communication skills means being able to present, to write, to hold meetings, to negotiate, right, to be able to work with clients. And that was highly rated out of all the leadership skills. The second one across the board with both genders and generations was the ability to organize people to lead large complex projects, really reflecting on how times have changed at work, that it is about leading teams and it is about having complex projects and we need leaders to be able to do that. Now, women have always been known to have good communication skills. So does this give women an advantage? Well, many women feel yes. Um, we know, again, when you're doing research and surveys, we just look at the data sets. But when I interviewed women, women felt that women were uniquely positioned because of all of their skills and, and um, attributes and that they were really in better, better positions than men moving forward into the future. So what about women and negotiating? What did your uh, research find in that area? So that was actually very interesting because we had conflicting results. So on the survey side between men and women, men and women rated men higher in negotiation. Hmm. But when I did the interviews, overwhelmingly 85% of women interviewed said, no, 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 no. You want a woman at the table. She is the best negotiator, particularly when uh, discussing complex negotiations. Hmm. So I went out to population and said, what's <coughs> going on? Why would I have conflicting results? Well, it ends up that people, when they hear the word negotiating, they have a perception of haggling for a car hmm. or in a bazaar, right? And it's a win-lose. But if you look at the modern research, negotiation is very different. Negotiation is all about collaboration, win-win, and it has shifted quite a bit. So that's where we think that the discrepancy came up, is really around what people perceive the word negotiation to mean. Hmm. Maybe Congress can learn something from Absol this. <laughs> Absolutely. So how important are mentors in people's working careers? So that was another one. Over 94% of our total population, both men and women, felt that mentorship was critical, both on the entrepreneurial side and at the corporate side. So it is important to have people. People do need people to help them. So that's why networking and having support systems are very important. It varied between the corporate side, it was have people inside and outside the firm, have networks above and below you. On the entrepreneurial side, they called it the personal board of advisors. We have moved away, we have shifted away to have that one role model that we follow through life to having a circle of advisors who will help us through many facets of our life because careers are so much more complex. Were there any differences between male and female mentors? In terms of, well, we didn't actually interview mentors. What the, what the, what the question was about is, are mentors important? Mm. And both men and women felt you do need mentors. You do need them. The major finding was really that mentorship has changed, that you really can't count on that one person anymore because that person may leave, that person may shift jobs. But what you're really looking for is to have a number of people advising you. So were there surprise findings? Absolutely. So here's an interesting thing. I've been researching for many years. I've looked at women's studies since the early 90s. And I would always ask a question. What influence has your mother had on your life or your career? And in my earlier studies, women would say, none. It's my father, it was a brother, mm. it was an uncle, male figure. In this study, when I interviewed 200 women, the word mom came up over 750 times. Wow, so that's, that's about interesting. Three to four times per interview. Mm -hmm. Mothers are very important 
to young people, not just women, but also men. They're key role models. And I think that's important as mothers and as daughters. That, that's fantastic to hear. Yes, it is. It I'm, warms the heart. Yeah, I'm really glad to hear that. Now, do you think the traditional gender roles are softening nowadays? So the gender roles, um, you know, it, it varies. And it's interesting as I see variation all throughout the world and all throughout the United States. But in general, yes, right, we see much more interest of the younger generations of dual participation in raising families, both, both participating in the workforce. Um, much more interest in lifestyle and having well-rounded lives rather than having dual lives with, you know, in role differentiation. So I guess in general we could say, you know, yes, we are sensing that. More so with the younger generation. They have many more options today than in the past. But um, we do see more of the blending because let's face it, both parents want to raise their children. Mm -hmm. And we do need both parents in many places, particularly California, to work, to really afford to live. Right, right. And women nowadays is still saddled with the caretaker role, right, you know, in, in many households. In many. So I have, a, I have a millennial on my team, and she was like, what role differentiation? Ah. So I'm, I'm the oven, and now he has to take over and do all the activities once, once the oven's done and the baby's born. So the attitude is completely different. Um, and both, both the parents are, are extremely involved with the child, uh, I would say 50-50. So I, again, I think the attitudes are shifting with the younger generation. A lot of it depends on how you're raised, right. what kind of cultural nuances right. and norms are passed from, from families to daughters and sons. Uh, but you do see that it isn't uh, just about the mom. That's really good to hear. That, that's encouraging. I, I get very excited because uh, of sons. You know, you want to have both parents raising right. your sons. And right. you want to have both parents uh, influencing your daughter. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. So I, I think activity from both is just great. How about the different type of jobs that women are choosing? Are they choosing more non-traditional uh, female jobs? So here's the advice I give anyone looking for a job today, college students, you know, trying to make decisions. If your goal is to get ahead and make money, there are industries and positions where you can make money, right? It's going to be in the engineering, it's going to be in medical, it's going to be in data and research. Um, if you're looking for something different, develop a skill that sets you apart. High demand jobs pay well. Jobs that require higher levels of education pay well. So you need to think about that. Jobs that incur more risk pay better than the jobs that don't have more risk, right? I mean, I myself shifted. My first job out of college was in magazines. Mm -hmm. And I worked at Vogue. Great glamour, not doesn't pay very well. Mm -hmm. I quickly figured out it was the salespeople, the people selling advertising were the ones who wore the better clothes and the ones who had the better apartments in New York. And I said, what am I going to do? I'm going to shift into a higher risk position because it pays better. So I think each of us have to think about the choices we make in careers and the payoff. So there seems to be um, a wage gap in the type of uh, jobs that uh, women choose. Is that right? Well, there's wage gaps, absolutely. And certain industries have lo are lower paying than other industries. Each of us has the ability to make a choice on what kind of career or job that we'd like to pursue. Now, interesting here in Silicon Valley, many of the companies have grade levels, right? They have different stratifications of salary. My encouragement for people is if you're in a company and you feel like you're stuck, look for opportunities for mobility within the company, but don't forget to look for opportunities outside of the company. And I think a lot of people think that they have to stay in one company forever, but the reality is that people are changing jobs every four, point, four years and four months. And it's, really hmm. the sweet spot, according to recruiters, is having about four to seven years in a job and then either making a shift inside the firm to build up another skill or making a shift outside and build up management skills or other opportunities or other industry exposure. Hmm. That's interesting. Four point 
Four years and four, four months. Four years Bureau and four months. Bureau of Labor Statistics is wow. the average turnover rate now in jobs. That's in fact, companies' average life has reduced. The average company today is only around 15 years. Mm. So if you think about it, if you're working for a long time, you will inevitably be moving around to at least one or two companies, mm. many people 10-plus companies. Mm. Interesting, 10-plus companies. Oh, yeah, sure. You could be working for... 50, 60 years mm -hmm. today. Right, right. Uh, you could have about five or six 10 year careers. Mm, interesting. So, um, you had also written about um, women in international business. Um, you wrote about women working in China, Japan, Europe, and Mexico, among other countries. T tell me about that. Sure. So, my earliest research was really about my life and what I was doing in my work life, which was I was a, an American woman in my early 20s traveling overseas on business representing high-tech firms in the area of manufacturing. Very masculine, very early days in international business. There were very few women traveling overseas, particularly at, at that age. I met resistance from many countries because the, role, the roles were very different than in the United States. Was very, the men worked, the women stayed home. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had a hard time really establishing credibility, um, making deals, you know, being able to survive in a manufacturing uh, environment. Uh, so I interviewed. I started my research and interviewed hundreds of women who were successful in international business. And here's what, per, you know, really three things came across in every book that I wrote on it and every research study. Number one, uh, credibility. At that time, women really needed to have established credibility before they left. And I think that's important because particularly working here, you have offices overseas and they can create your credibility before you come, mm -hmm. whether it was through announcing you or sending a bio, right, your biography in advance or mm -hmm. highlighting some of your uniqueness, your education. So credibility was important to establish it before you go. Number two is competence. Right, that you have to be competent because traveling overseas is expensive. So the expectation is that if you're representing the firm, you are very competent. So it's important that women stress that whoever you send overseas is competent. Number three is confidence. It is an awkward feeling when you move into a masculine environment and you feel outnumbered. Mm -hmm. You quickly start to question your own competence. Mm -hmm. Are you able to perform? And so it's important that you remember you are competent, mm -hmm. you are credible, and remain confident so that you can actually execute to the business. And I think those three takeaways were very important for no matter who is doing business, gender-wise at this point, you know, overseas. Mm -hmm. So do, do you find that like in countries like China and Japan, it's more challenging? So it varies, right? So you have, um, I, I actually dissected out by country and by age. So when I went to Japan and South Korea, I had the most challenges with men 50 and up, quite, quite interesting. When I went to countries like Singapore, Hong Kong, before it was part of China, and China, it was more neutralized. And I think a lot of that is just the communist influence and in men and women working. When I went to places like Mexico, it was much more hierarchy and role differentiation. I mean, I remember meeting an executive in Mexico, and I walked into the room, and I said, how do you do? And he said, well, I'm waiting for Dr. Weiland. And I said, I am Dr. Weiland. He said, I don't meet with women. Oh, my so goodness. So I said, well, if you want to meet with Dr. Weiland, this is your only choice today. Wow. And so he disgruntled, you know, had to meet with me uh, because it was totally unexpected for him and uncomfortable for mm -hmm. him. And how did that go, that meeting? Uh, it went well. You know, uh, it's quite interesting. I've had a number of situations where there's awkward moments. I remember being in Japan uh, where an executive asked me to get some tea, uh, mistaking me and because I was the only female at the table as, as a, the likely admin. And so I had to stand up and said, great idea. How about somebody go get us some tea? And I actually remember I moved my seat because I was late to that meeting and I sat in what I would call the weak seat mm. at the end of the table. Mm. And I asked my male counterpart to put me back in the middle, the center, so that people immediately understood that I was leading the meeting. 
and not the T. <laughs> and not, not their server. server T. Exactly. So then I talked to two CEOs married to each other. They wanted four kids. But their definition of success and what they wanted their lifestyle was that one parent would stay home and one parent would work, at least for the growth years of the children. Mm -hmm. So how did they sort it out? She said, we sat down at the table and said, who hates your job more? <laughs> and he said, I do. <laughs> so he stayed home mm. and she continued. And then eventually they'll make a plan to reverse it or transition it in mm -hmm. some way. So the bottom line is, is everybody makes choices and has to define their, you know, what is success for them and what is having it all for them. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like uh, the woman has to have a partner who is willing participant in this idea. Well, we always say, pick your partner well. Whatever your choices are, if you decide that you want to stay home and raise children, you have to pick your partner well, mm -hmm. particularly if you're living out in this, in this area. Mm -hmm. If you want to have a full-time career and travel, you need to pick your partner well. If you want to be an entrepreneur, right, you need to pick your partner as well. So I think that's just stated no matter what choice you have. Or people may choose not to have a partner at all mm -hmm. and to find success in a different way. Right, yeah. right. So what advice would you give to women who want to re-enter the workforce after several years of absence? Yes, I know. And there's been a lot of uh, research on that as well. So, you know, my encouragement for women, if you step out of the workforce, keep active in some way, right? Just keep your skills going. If it's, even if it's, you know, working on a website, volunteering your time in some capacity, because employers like to see that you have current skills and that you're aware, right, in doing things that they, that are useful for the employment. So I wouldn't drop everything. And I think a lot, of, a lot of women and men realize that you need to be actively engaged. Mm -hmm. I think you have to keep up your networks. You know, I think that's very important. At the end of the day, recruiters will tell you that 75 to 85% of the time, the job is found through who you know. Mm -hmm. So being able to do that. I think part-time and volunteerism is very important, even if it's once a week. I had a gentleman who was out of the workforce for quite some time, but he volunteered his uh, IT. Mm -hmm. information technology and he volunteered one day a week in a hospital and eventually he was transitioned in. Why? Because it was on site, he knew the systems and he was top of mind for when the job opening happened. So I think there are ways. You can always move into also, if you're more seasoned, consulting roles, advising small firms, mm -hmm. mentoring, and a lot of those nonprofit firms. So there are choices for people who have been in and out of the workforce. Mm -hmm. That's that's very good advice because a lot of women are facing that situation right now. Absolutely, and I think the one just keep current, and if women can just remember that, to keep active in doing something so that your your resume, so to speak, doesn't have the big gap, but mm -hmm. has some sort of continuing you know continuing your skill sets. Mm -hmm. And what is different today for women and careers than uh, in the past? You know. I grew up in a classical world. The high school degree and the liberal arts degree pretty much got you anything in every job. And a large company was the choice, right? You went to a large company, they took over your training, and they took over your employment pretty much. Today it's different. We live in a technology-based world. The velocity of job change is much higher, but there's many more choices. So the big thing that I really encourage younger people today is look at all the options you have today. You can work for a large firm, you can work for a medium-sized firm, a small firm, entrepreneur, self-employment, mm -hmm. portfolio careers, which is a number of different kinds of jobs and gigs or freelance work. There's so many more choices today, but what you need to do is go investigate it, right? And understand what options are out there for you, right? For me, doctor, lawyer, public sector, teacher, right? The, the choices were just so limited. Today, the world is your oyster. What is the best way to um, investigate the different uh, possibilities? So fortunately, in today's environment, because of technology, so much is more is out there, right? So I would go, you know, I have a lot of students say to me, I want to work at Facebook, I want to work at Google or Apple. Go to the website. These companies give so much quality information in form of interview advice, videos, chat rooms, that you can actually learn a lot about the company right there. 
Number two, we have social media. Network through your Facebook, your LinkedIn, huge fan of LinkedIn, and find people who work in the company and talk to them. Ask them before you go to college, while you're in high school, what, what, did you, what do you do at the company? What courses did you take? How did you get in? What experience do I need? Prepare yourself. And I think we just need to be, because there are so many more choices, we really need to start preparing at a much younger age so that we can maximize and really pick something that's interesting for us. Very good advice, Tracy. Well, thank you again for being with us. It's always so informative when you come to visit us. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for being with us today. Please remember to also watch our programs on YouTube. See you again next week on The Better Part. Bye-bye.